great section of the apocalypse. <clears throat> what we saw in chapter 17 was the final phase, the final revelation of the Catholic system when after Armageddon, even after when Rome has been destroyed, the papacy gets together again with Europe to oppose the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's what we saw in chapter 17, the very final manifestation of the Catholic system before it's totally and utterly obliterated. And as I said, there are three stages. This is why the great city divides into three parts. There is the destruction of Rome itself. There is the destruction of the woman riding the beast. And then there is the clearing of the world of all the remnants of the Catholic system from nation to nation. And that's why the city is divided into three parts as its destruction unfolds. <clears throat> so we have this apostasy that was predicted. And we're going to go quickly go through some of these because we did them last time. There's going to be a son of perdition. It was prophesied by Paul. He would sit in the temple of God, shows that he is God. We've seen how that came to pass. <clears throat> What we then have is the wicked one coming. And notice it says in Thessalonians, there will be a destruction of this wicked system by the brightness of the coming of Christ. And Christ is going to come to wipe this system out. It's there in Daniel. It's there in Thessalonians. It's here in Revelation. You can't miss this teaching of the Bible. And so we saw the harlot in her arrogance that we identified this, this Roman beast both the political, the, the, the heads of the Roman government, and the geography of the seven hills of Rome, you can't miss who God's talking about. A system that has committed fornication with the kings of the earth, and we're going to see that revival of that, that sixth head come back again as the eighth head. So that's what we saw in chapter 17. Now, I'm sure you're sitting there thinking while the reading was going on, this is an incredible amount of material. Well, let me tell you, chapter 18 is quite simple. It doesn't take half the explanation of chapter 17, and we're going to get as far as we can into chapter 19, uh, and hopefully a lot of it will be on the screen. So I'm going to make some assumptions on the screen you'll have to uh, hopefully take on board. So I want to just look at the timeline of Armageddon, and let's get this straight in our heads. And, and without going off into massive proofs, let's just look at the timeline of what happens around the coming of Christ. We firstly have the resurrection. So the first thing that's going to happen is Christ will come for the saints. The dead shall be raised first. The living will be gathered with them to meet Christ. And we believe that between the coming of Christ and the battle of Armageddon will probably be about 10 years. When Christ takes us away, the process of going through the review of our lives, the glorification, the preparation for the work ahead, the allocation of roles, the, the whole sorting out, the meeting of all the saints from all ages, that's what happens for us in the 10 years after the coming of Christ and the resurrection. And then we have the, the and included in that is the marriage of the lamb. There is the, 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 the joyous rejoicing of those who are made immortal with Christ. Then we have the battle of Armageddon. And that is the political forces that come against Jerusalem, the destruction of the armies of Russia and her confederates that take place in the Middle East. What then happens, we find in chapter 14. Let's go back to chapter 14, and let's just overlap these two records. In chapter 14, you have at the end of another series of, of uh, revelations that take place. In chapter 14, again, you have a, a picture of the end. And Revelation does this. You have in every generation, they have so much history, then you have a, a picture of the end of the process. And so we get information from chapter 14 about the synchronization of events. So in verse 1 to 5, you have a vision of the future of the saints. They are here as the glorified 144,000, the, the glorified Israel on Mount Zion with the Lamb. And so you have symbology there about the saints in their time of glory. And then it tells you what happens after that 10 years when they're with Christ and when the kingdom is set up after Armageddon. And it says this in verse 6. I saw another angel. That's, Fly in the midst of heaven. So in, in government, now we're talking heaven revelation, we're often talking about government, the place of government. So the kingdom of Christ makes a pronouncement in verse 6, and it's called the gospel of the age. So a proclamation goes out after, after Armageddon, and people are given 10 years to obey it. And the proclamation is, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgments is come. So they are warned that judgments after Armageddon. So Armageddon's taken place. Great earthquakes have, have, have happened around the world. There's chaos. There's 
tsunamis, there's all kinds of work has to be done. And people are given 10 years to submit in this, what we call the Midheaven Proclamation. And they are there and it's commanded to the, that all kindreds and tongues and people should submit. So that's the first proclamation that happens after Armageddon. But of course, by this stage, people have decided they don't want the kingdom of Christ. So in verse 8, a great sign is given, one last warning is given to all the nations of the world, and that is the complete obliteration of the city of Rome. Another angel followed Babylon, is fallen, is fallen, that great city that made the nations drunk with the wine of a fornication. Again, the same identification as you get in Revelation 17 and 18. So we then have the fall of Rome in chapter 14 and verse 8. So there's a warning to everybody, do what Christ says or else. But they don't. And that's when you have chapter 17. The Catholics will probably create a new pope, reorganize themselves in Central Europe, get all the nations of Europe organized to fight against Christ. And that is the final picture in Revelation 17 of the woman riding the beast. And they, of course, are likewise destroyed. And after that, you have the conquest of the nations. And here's another chart of the same thing. The return and resurrection for 10 years in blue, Armageddon, Jesus, King in Jerusalem, Midheaven Proclamation, the harlot and the beast come in that stage. Rome goes, the final command goes out, and over the next 30 years, not only is Catholicism extinguished, but the nations are commanded and brought under control completely. So that at the end of 50 years from the coming of Christ, the kingdom will open with the temple in Jerusalem. So in that 30 years, not only the conquest of all nations, there's the regathering of the Jews, the resettlement of the nations, the building of the temple, all of those things happen in that, that last 30 years. And that's how the timelines of Revelation fit together. So what we have in chapter 18 and 19, again, forgetting the chapter divisions, is the final demise of Rome. Let's go to chapter 18 and just look at how this divides up. And it's important to notice that verse 1 and 3 are a summary of what you get through the rest of that section. Um, so verse 4 to 24 tells us in detail what happens. The summary is in verse 1 to 3. So let's just read that. After these things, another angel came down from heaven. Um, notice this is a different angel to the one that has been talking to John. So this angel, we believe, um, is probably the, the, the sixth angel um, of the vials because it's the one that relates to us at the time of the resurrection. That's an interesting question we can talk about. Another angel comes along and he's got great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of demons and so forth. And, and we have this summary of what's now going to follow in the rest of chapter 18. Okay, so verse 4 to 5, there's a call to separate from Catholicism, and it's made, we believe, primarily to the Jews in Europe. And, of course, there are still plenty of Jews in Europe, and if we think they're the ones that identified here as my people. In verse 6 to 8, the declaration of, 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 of the judgment is given, um, that it is going to come upon the system of Rome. Verse 9 to 10, the lament by the kings of the earth when Rome is destroyed. Verse 11 to 17, the merchants, which, of course, in all those who've made money out of Rome and all those who've prospered in Rome's glory, the bishops and priests, all of those people who have been supported by this system are going to lament her fall. Verse 17 to 19, a lament by the mariners, and that is people overseas. Um, of course, all the missionaries and the, and the overseas cathedrals and systems, etc. Verse 20 is the rejoicing of the saints. Verse 21 to 24, the millstone cast into the sea. And then in chapter 19, we have the rejoicing of the true bride. So while it might be a large section, we're going to do a lot of it on the screen. And a lot of it is really quite straightforward. Okay, let's move on to it. Well, this other angel coming down from heaven, this, this is, of course, a symbol of the kingdom of Christ and the saints with Christ proclaiming that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So this is when Rome has been destroyed, and it says it, she, and it, she had become. The, the Greek there where it says she has become should be she had become. It's actually in the past tense. She had become the refuge of demons 
And of course, when you think about what Rome has done, they have these guardian saints. Remember the prophecy in Timothy, they would give, you know, respect to demons and doctrines of departed spirits. Well, here we have, you know, this thing, they become a dwelling for demons. And of course, every Roman church you go into, and if you've ever been through Europe, you get sick and tired of cathedrals, but every one of them is, is covered in statues to the saints. And they're all called after saints. Um, so these, this refuge of demons, this guardian spirits, foul spirits, and, and we're going to talk later on about some of the, the horrible morality of some of the popes and, and some of the horrible church policies they've adopted, become the, the cage of every hateful and unclean bird. You know, there are child abusers from Australia that fled to the Vatican and were given jobs in the Vatican Library and won't come out because the minute they step outside the Vatican City, they'd be arrested. And the church knows they're there and they won't send them back to Australia. They won't send them back to Ireland. They become the, 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 the foul cage of all these child abusers protected by the Vatican. And the morality of the church through the centuries is, is totally abominable. So there's all these things that are there. The, the, the orders, the, the Jesuits, the Opus Dei, the Franciscans, the brothers of St. John. And you can go through enormous lists of all the different cages of birds that they have built into the Roman Catholic system. So there they are. And the kings of the earth, as we said, have fornicated with the Pope. They love to go and talk to the Pope. Very rarely he visits them. You'll notice that. They go and visit him. Uh, it's the, the one-way traffic. But they, the kings of the earth live deliciously with her, and they have been corrupted and bemused by the, the kings of the earth with the papacy. So we have no problem identifying the, the corrupt system. It had become, the reason it was destroyed, they had become the cage of all these unclean systems. In verse 3, because of the corruption of the kings of the earth, who were, were just bemused by the wealth and the, the pomp and the status of this church. Well, in the midst of that, we find that there are the merchants who have been made rich in verse 3. The merchants of the earth made rich through the abundance of her delicacies. We don't have any idea of how great the church was in the Dark Ages, how much they accumulated wealth and power and art treasures in abundance. You might never have heard of this man. I'd never heard of him until I went to Augsburg in Germany. And this man is Jacob Fugger, and they say he is the most the richest man comparative that's ever lived. Whether it outdo Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, I'm not sure. But at the time, you know, we, we were in Augsburg a few years ago, he was regarded as the richest man that's ever lived. And he got rich by supplying the papacy, by importing from China and the Middle East and all the things that the papacy wanted for their garments, their ivory, their wood, their supplies. Jacob Fugger supplied all of that. He became the richest man ever lived because of his support of the papacy with goods. You go to Augsburg and there's a whole suburb that he built in the city of Augsburg for poor Catholics. He had so much money, he was able to build this place and he said, People who live there will only ever pay one guilder per year rent. And the rent has been the same for 500 years. They still pay one guilder rent because of the money that Jacob Fugger left behind is supporting this whole suburb. And it's just an amazing that the wealth of these merchants, and we don't see it so much today, but in the Middle, the middle Ages, people got enormously wealthy by supplying the Vatican with goods. And that's what it looks like, beautifully kept and maintained, um, all run on, on the strength of this man's money. So we have a cry in verse 4 that goes out, and it notice it's another voice. So a different voice now speaks to people to say, come out of this system. Another voice. And I believe this is the Elijah group. After, after Armageddon, after things have taken place, there is a call for the Jews to leave Europe. And where it says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and receive not of her plagues. And I believe the voice here is, is Elijah with perhaps Moses and the patriarchs and Joshua and Samuel and people like that who will lead the second exodus of the Jews through the wilderness of the people. So there's an appeal to the Jews of Europe to leave Europe and to go with the saints, that they don't get caught up in the judgments that are coming upon Catholic Europe. And we know this is true from the Bible. Malachi, I send you Elijah the prophet. To Jews, God said this. I send you Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Whether Elijah goes out before Armageddon or whether it's part of this as well, there will be a call for the Jews to come out of Europe and separate themselves from the Catholic Europe. And it says in Ezekiel 20, 
I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and plead with you face to face. And I'll plead with you and I'll cause you to pass under the rod and bring you into the bonds of the covenant. And God intends to rescue the Jews from all over the world. And particularly those in Catholic Europe, they have to get out before the judgments fall. And that will be the other voice calling them to leave. So he says in verse 5, for her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. We then come to verse 7 to verse 9. And it talks about how Rome had lived deliciously in the earth. Um, in verse 5, it says, her sins have reached unto heaven. Brother Thomas translates it as her followers have been her sins. Um, and, and it's very true that, that this was a terrible system. Okay, well, you notice she says later on, she says, I am no widow. One of the things that Rome boasts in verse 7 is, I am no widow. I want to talk about this little period between 1860 and, and, and 1930. That, you know, when there was the rebellion in, in Italy and Garibaldi and the troops came in and they confined the Pope to the Vatican area. So the Vatican, had, which had controlled Europe for hundreds of years, all of a sudden was locked up in this little square mile of the Vatican. And the Pope got so annoyed about the fact that he had no influence anymore that he decided to tell the world that he was now God and that he spoke the voice of God. And, and so came in the doctrine of ex cathedra, the Pope speaking from his chair could actually make proclamations equivalent to the Bible. So the Pope's retaliation was to sit in the Vatican and sulk for, 30, for 70 years and, and to say, well, I am, I am the voice of God on earth. And he waited for the nations to come back. And when the Nazis came to power, they made an agreement with the Pope that they would support each other. And so the Pope's now got influence in the world again from 1930 onwards. At the time of the end, of course, the Pope will be on the side of Russia and those who invade the Middle East. And then again, after Armageddon, they will still be opposing the Lord Jesus Christ very violently. So she says, I am a no widow. And so these are the reasons for the destruction of the system. In verse 5, her iniquities. In verse 6, according to her works. So she gets double of the terrible things she's done. She's glorified herself. She's lived in great riches. She's going to receive sorrow. She claims she's a queen and not a widow, which, of course, is what she's done since 1930. I'm back. I'm a queen. I'm the mother of all churches. She no longer has her widowhood garments on. And so her plagues will come in one day, swift. Death, mourning, famine in verse 8, utterly burned with fire. The kings of the earth will wail in verse 9, standing afar off. For in one hour thy judgment is come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep over her. For no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And it goes on to talk about all the merchandise that she's accumulated over the years. You go to these places, these cathedrals, you go to St. Peter's, you can't believe the art treasures, the statues. You know, the, the hangings, the, the, the glorious jewellery, the, the gold, unbelievable wealth they've accumulated from all these merchants of the earth. And so we have all these people weeping over the destruction of Rome. And where did this start in modern times? Well, it started in 1957, the Treaty of Rome. It's when Europe decided that they would unite and form the European Economic Community. It was the Treaty of Rome in 1957 that sat down in the Vatican and decided that Europe should be united force again after World War II. Sixty years later, where did they go back to celebrate? Rome, same place. You see how the woman is now riding the beast again. She's got control 60 years later. And what about the merchandise? Well, this is the EU leaders with the Pope on the on the day of the 60th celebration in the Vatican in 2017. He's all the kings of Europe. He's all the presidents of Europe. He's all the heads of state. Who's in the middle? The good old Pope. They all want to be seen with the Pope. It's just amazing how accurate this is. And so it says, therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. The city of Rome is scheduled for obliteration, probably by volcanic activity. It'll go down in one day. It'll disappear from the face of the earth. Okay, let's talk about the merchandise. Those of you who have actually got sick of going through cathedrals, as you do, will know 
what you get sick of is seeing the gold, the statues, the brilliant carvings of wood, the idols, the images, the stations of the cross, the, the beautiful painted ceilings. All of these things were, were brought into Rome and it made the world rich. All the merchants got rich by supplying Rome with these goods. But now Rome's gone. So all the merchants of the earth are going to weep over this. But it wasn't just ancient history. You know, Rome has become incredibly involved in commercial affairs. Here's the Pope lecturing oil and energy executives. What's that got to do with Christianity? You know, the Pope is telling them how they're going to run their, their, their oil policies and energy policies for the future. Again, you notice they all come and sit in the Vatican and Mark meekly sit there while the Pope tells them what to do. Here's the Pope with the guardians, with the Rothschilds and the guardian CEOs trying to put together a world order for the world finances. And the Pope's running it. Here's the Pope with the guardians for inclusive capitalism. The merchants of Revelation chapter 18, all the people who are looking to the papacy to unite the world's economy. This is happening right today. You know, the Bible predicted this. All these merchants and all these bankers will be there, wringing their hands and saying, what happened to good old Rome? Well, it's gone. The bank that can save the world. That's how the, how the, how the magazines put it. Well, it's going to go. Just like great Babylon went. Verse 10. I'll stand afar off for fear of the torment that Babylon got, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour thy judgment is come. When Rome is obliterated off the face of the map, there's going to be tremendous consternation. Now, why does God keep calling Rome Babylon? Well, because ancient Babylon suffered a very similar fate. You know, that great city Babylon is the way God describes Rome in the apocalypse. Well, Look what happened to ancient Babylon. We know ancient Babylon, grand, proud. Is not this great Babylon I have built, said the king? Idolatrous, educated, looked like it would last forever. It went down in one night. God said Cyrus would come. He would subdue the, the nations. He would loose the loins of kings. And Cyrus came. The one whose name means the one like the heir who led the kings out of a sun's rising. And he came to Babylon, he destroyed it in one night. And that's why ancient Babylon is used to represent the city of Rome today. Babylon today is in ruins. Nothing left except a few diggings. They can dig up some of the walls and some of the stones. Now here's a summary, and we'll just quickly run through this. When you go back to the prophets, what was said about how Babylon would fall and you compare what Revelation says would happen to the city of Rome, the comparisons are just brilliant. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Verse 2, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. In Isaiah 13, verse 2, one, devils shall dance there. It's become the habitation of devils. Babylon, the nations have drunken of her wine. The nations have drunk of the wine of her fornication. My people, go out of the midst of her. Come out of her, my people. Her judgment reached under heaven. The heavens, the sins have reached under heaven. Recompense her according to her work. Reward her as she's rewarded you. And so it goes on. I shall be a lady forever, Babylon said in Isaiah 47. I shall not sit as a widow. In, in Revelation 18, verse 7, I sit a queen and not a widow. Babylon shall hiss at her plagues. Her plagues shall come in one day. Gates will burn with fire, utterly burn with fire. The Redeemer is strong. Yahweh of hosts is his name. Strong as Yahweh is the Lord God who judgeth her. The heavens and the earth shall sing for Babylon. Rejoice over her, thou heaven. And in Jeremiah 50, Babylon's destruction is portrayed as a great stone being cast into the river Euphrates. And here a great millstone is cast into the sea. And you can make a lot more comparisons between the prophets about Babylon's destruction and how God sees the destruction of the Roman Catholic system. Uh, I've got some notes on that if you want a, a detailed copy of that later on, but... It just shows you why it's called Great Babylon. That God foreshadowed the ruin of Catholicism and Rome in particular in the fall of ancient Babylon. So we come to the end of chapter 18. There's a lot of verses there about the merchants and the mariners all morning. I want to just come to the end of chapter 18 and see it there 
in a bit more detail because it says at the end, coming to verse 21, a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and be found no more at all. So this angel picks up an enormous millstone and throws it into the sea. And of course, it will sink straight to the bottom and never come up. And that's what this is portrayed. Now, notice in verse 20, the people who are given the privilege to witness this rejoice over her, <clears throat> thou heaven, which of course is the saints in rulership, ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And, you know, the apostles joined the prophets in dying for their faith. Many prophets were killed because of their prophecies against kings and so forth. But, they were joined later on by the prophets and the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And so the apostles and prophets are the ones who particularly will have the privilege of getting rid of this system. The mighty angel, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to take this system and throw it into the sea like a great millstone. And it will sink. Great force will be used. Great impact will be had. And it will sink forever. And you can see that millstone then sinking to the bottom of the sea. That's how God describes the destruction of Babylon. But why a millstone? You know, instead of ancient Babylon, a great rock. Why in Revelation is it now turned into a millstone? What's the one other place where a millstone is mentioned in the New Testament? Sorry? You are the right quote. Matthew 18. Let's look at it. Here it is. Matthew 18, verse 6. Now, Jesus said this, Who shall offend one of these little ones that believeth in me? Were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. The Australian Royal Commission found that 7% of Catholic priests in Australia were alleged offenders. 1,880 perpetrators amongst priests and clergy were identified so far. 40% of the John, St. John of God brothers are alleged pedophiles. The church hierarchy covered them up for years. I want to read the story of Chicago. You know, one particular priest there abused over 200 children. It was just moved from parish to parish to parish to parish, and they paid off any victims who spoke up. And the great scandal across the world of the Catholic Church, the cage, it had become the cage of every unclean and foul spirit and bird and vulture. And some priests are still hiding in Rome. You know, Jesus said, if, if you offend the little ones that believe in me, better than a millstone were hanged about your neck. And that's why the stone of ancient prophecy about Babylon now becomes a millstone. And that's why this system has to go, because it's corrupt to the core. And what did they do when all the victims came forward? Well, they bought them off. They bought their silence with money. And they left them to their fate. And many of those people have committed suicide. In Zechariah 11, the prophecy about the worthless shepherd, a foolish shepherd, shall not visit those that are cut off, shall not seek out those that are scattered, shall not heal that which is broken. You know, again, the destruction of the papacy was prophesied in Zechariah chapter 11 because of their carelessness towards those that they have offended. You can see why God says the millstone is going to be cast into the sea. And then look at the things that will disappear, the wealth of the place. You know, the great wealth that we saw described here, just, just a few things about the incalculable wealth of the Catholics. As I said, they confess to owning at least 6,500 properties in Europe. Add to that the cathedrals and the nunneries and the monks and all that sort of stuff. They own 6,500 commercial properties in Europe. That's a lot of land, a lot of buildings. Fabulous wealth. The, guard, the fortresses of guardian saints, as Daniel 11 describes them. You know, St. Peter's, St. Matthew's, St. Nicholas's, and everything else, all of these churches named after saints. Fabulous Catholic wealth. Just a few of the homes of the bishops of different countries. The Bishop of Galveston, that's where he lives. The Bishop of Wells. The Bishop of Melbourne. And Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. These guys live in opulence and luxury. And every Catholic bishop, you go and look up where the Catholic bishop in Perth lives. It won't be a hovel, I can assure you. 
And all over the world, people are living in, in, in luxurious settings because of the wealth of this church. Look what it says in verse 22. The voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more in thee at all. You've heard of the famous papal choir. It goes all over the world. The papal choir with their harpers and musicians. And you go to any cathedral when a ceremony is on. And the music is overpowering and influential. And people are on their faces because of the glory and the majesty of the surroundings and the music that they hear. No more are going to be heard. The papal choir will disappear. No more the candles. It says there in verse 23, the light of the candle shall shine no more. Yeah, one of the features of a Catholic church, you go in and right at the front door, you can buy candles and you light a candle and you pray to your saint and you put the candle at the front and the next day they sell the same candles again. And, and it's a great system for people buying candles to actually pray to the saints. But no more the light of a candle shall shine in there. And, 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 you know, cathedrals are marked by candle selling. Incredible that that's mentioned here in such great detail. They have candle mass day where people buy even more candles. It's quite amazing. We were in the Philippines and in Cebu and they have a big thing there where you can pray to Mary and you, you've got to buy your candles. And we went back at the end of the day just to have another look and there was a guy gathering up the candles for resale because you have to throw them through the grill towards Mary and they sell the same candles again. It's just a great system for making money. You know, the Catholics have this pomp and, and all this, the, the craftsmen in verse 22, you know, the, the, the greatest art collections in the world, the greatest statues, the icons, the, the wood carvings, the, the decoration of cathedrals, it's just magnificent. It's all going to go. It's going to be taken away because it deceives people. And papal marketing will stop. I remember in, back in the, in the 70s when the Pope visited Los Angeles and they, the papal marketing, because if you when, a pope, when the Pope goes on tour, you have to buy the rights to use anything connected with the Pope's tour. And a, a company that was involved in selling um, <clears throat> waters and hoses and sprinklers, they got the rights to sell the rights to use the papal endorsement for their product. And they sold it as lettuce spray. But they had to buy it off the Catholic Church, the rights to sell it under Let Us Spray with the Pope's image alongside of it. And this is the merchandising of this organisation. And all these merchants are mentioned over and over again in the verse of the merchants of the great men of the earth. And they were all deceived by the papacy. You know, there's an appalling uh, crime history behind the papacy. You know, the, the sorceries it mentions there. You know, that no more sorceries allowed. In verse 24, by those sorceries, nations are delivered. And you have all these grottos and these places you can go, like Lourdes and the one in Hungary where you can go and actually be healed by Mary and the statue of Mary. And people go there and reckon they've been healed. And, and all these things are then promulgated around the world as, as, as healings where they're actually nothing more than psychosomatic cures. You know, the person who's generally lost a leg never gets a new leg. But people who go there thinking they've got a couple of headaches come away thinking, I feel a lot better today. And, and you know, it's all promoted as being Mary is there. You can worship Mary and the miracles, that the sorceries that they commit. And what about the, the voice of the false prophet pr trumpeting the theories of the French Revolution, liberty, equality and fraternity? You know, nations were deceived. People listen to the Pope today. They don't hear the Pope of the mid in the mid-1500s, who said everybody that's not a Catholic's got to die, what they hear is the Pope saying, oh, well, if somebody's gay and he wants to seek God, who am I to criticise? And the mouth of the false prophet is actually speaking the words of the frogs because that makes them popular. When they get power, it'll be different. They'll go back to their old ways of ruling people with domination. But they're adopting the woke speech right now because it gets them popularity. The crimes of the papacy, an appalling history of crimes. Read about Pope Joan. You know, there's a spot in Rome where no Catholic will walk, no, no priest will go. It's where Pope Joan delivered a baby. You know, um, she was actually a woman disguised as a man. Read about when they dug up the previous pope because the two popes, the two guys stood for the papacy. One didn't get it. Well, when the one that got it died, he dug him up and put him on trial for being ambitious because he'd beaten him in the election. <laughs> You know, this is the kind of stuff the papacy's been doing. And, and this is supposed to be the name of Christ. And you go, you've got the, the relics. You know, you, the Catholic system has got, 
bones of saints. It's got feathers of angels, the finger of the Holy Spirit, enough wood of the cross to build the ark, and the blood of Christ. And you can go to Bruges in Belgium today, and they have this procession every year where they bring out the blood of Christ and they parade it through the streets. And in front of this is all the flagellists, people with whips beating themselves so they bleed on the back. And they carry the blood of Christ through the streets today. This is the sorceries that people have been deceived by. When it's all gone, when Rome disappears, they're going to say, what happened? What happened to all that? It's all gone. And the major reason is what it says at the end of chapter 18. In her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all that was slain upon the earth. Now notice, God never forgets his prophets. You know, the prophets are people who actually stood up and spoke the word of God when it was unpopular. And a lot of them died for it. God always has a special category of the prophets. You go into Revelation, you'll find the prophets are always in a special category. Just flick back to chapter 11. Let me show it to you. The end of chapter 11, talking about the resurrection. And it says, verse 18, The nations were angry, their wrath is come, the time of the dead they should be judged. But thou shalt as a reward to thy servants, the prophets. You know, in God's eyes, the resurrection, <laughs> number one is about the prophets getting what they deserve for what they suffered. And then he says, and to the saints, and those that fear thy name, small and great. But the prophets are right up front. And they always are when you read a revelation. You know, the prophets are always mentioned first. You know, the angel in chapter 22 says to John, John, don't worship me. I'm the brother of your prophets. I'm a fellow servant of the prophets. God's got them in a very special category. And that's why here in verse 24, in her was found the blood of prophets, and the persecution of prophets started with Jezebel, right back in the days of, of Ahab, and of saints, and all that was slain upon the earth. Now, the last category doesn't only include people who believe the truth. As I said, they estimate some 68 million people perished at the hand of the Catholic Inquisition and Catholic persecutions in the Dark Ages. They were people that the church got rid of because they weren't willing to be Catholics. So all those were saying that all that blood is waiting to be avenged, but particularly the prophets and the saints. And so we have this, this history that started with Rome, right back in the days of John. And it's going to end up with this final destruction, like a millstone being cast into the sea. Let's just review some of the history. In the days of the pagans, when John was, was around, in the days of the emperors, if you didn't burn incense to the god emperor, then you were put to death in the stadium. And here's a picture of a woman refusing to, to worship on that idol's image and to burn incense to the emperor. And she would lose her life for that. That's how pagan Rome dealt with their brethren and sisters. They were brutal. Christians were either burned at the stake as torches in the stadium or in the Nero's garden, or they were put to death with, with the lions. You know, God remembers Rome for this. This is why the city of Rome has to be destroyed. But Catholic Rome came along and they were sadistic. You know, the epitaph of Rome is, in her was found the blood of prophets and the saints and all that was slain upon the earth. They were sadistic in the way they tortured people. Every refinement of slow torture that even the Assyrians couldn't invent, the Romans in the Inquisition invented it. And they put the death, people to death in the most slow and horrible ways that they could imagine. They invented the garrote, the rack, waterboarding. All of those things came out of the Roman Catholic Church. You can go, if you go to the city of Constance, you go across the lake. And the castle across the lake from Constance in Germany, you can go down and you can see one of the torture chambers of the Inquisition with all the original instruments there. And you'll come out feeling sick, I can tell you. And, and Meersburg Castle it is. And they've got all of this stuff still there and the persecutions that they put people through. And so the eternal city is going to disappear. Never be found again. Rome will go. And that's what chapter 18 is about. The city will be destroyed. And then, of course, there will be the conquest of the remnants of Catholicism throughout the earth after that. Never to reappear. You know, Gog and, Gog and Magog, who are part of Ezekiel 38, part of Armageddon, will come back at the end of the thousand years. You will never see Roman Catholicism ever, ever come back during the kingdom. It will be gone forever totally and utterly removed. Now, the rejoicing, forget the chapter division, 
after these things, a great voice in heaven. So in authority, in power, now are the saints. And we have the rejoicing bride in verse 1 to 5. And they rejoice over the destruction of, of everything to do with Rome. So the harlot system is exposed, condemned, and destroyed worldwide. And then they rejoice. Now, I want you to notice this. You know, we love the hallelujah chorus, don't we? Grand piece of music. Handel picked up Revelation 5, verse 13, Revelation 11, verse 15, Revelation 19, verse 6. Put it together into one hallelujah chorus. But never told us why people are singing hallelujah. Sounds great. But the reason they're singing hallelujah is what you read in verse 2. A great voice in heaven. So this is the saints in rulership. They sing hallelujah, salvation, glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. For here's the why. True and righteous are thy judgments. He's judged the great whore, which is to corrupt the earth with her fornication. He's avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And a second time, and again, a second time, they sing hallelujah as her smoke rises up forever. So there's two stages there. There's the destruction of the city of Rome. There's the wiping out of the woman riding the beast in Europe. The third stage is at the end of chapter 19, the three, the, the three divisions of the great city. And in verse 4, the four and 20 elders agree. Now, the four and 20 elders, of course, is taken from the kingdom of David. It's mentioned in chapter 4. It's the saints in rulership. So the saints in rulership worship God that sat on the throne saying, hallelujah. So next time you hear the hallelujah chorus, think to yourself, why would the saints want to sing hallelujah as they did? Well, because he's judged the great whore. Now, look at Brother Roberts. This is beautiful. And can I only recommend to you, if you think Revelation's a bit complicated and you know where to start, read 13 lectures. A brilliant summary of the book of Revelation. Brother Roberts says this. He has judged the great whore. This sentiment is entirely obnoxious to modern Christianity. Boasting of the New Testament as a source of its inspiration, it yet has no place for foreshadowing the retributive visitation of the blood of saints and prophets on their ecclesiastical murderers. In other words, what he's saying is the modern church has got no idea how God views what happened to the saints in past generations. They today would want to accept the Catholics as being fellow Christians. Well, it's not like that. The saints will be rejoicing because judgment finally has fallen upon this terrible system by the hand of God. And we now have a contrast between two women. In chapter 17, we saw the final manifestation of the Roman system in Europe, a corrupt prostitute. Here in Revelation 19, we have chaste virgins to Christ. Red and scarlet on the woman, the harlot, royal robes. The saints have pure and white garments of immortality, justification. The cup of fornication, they have the cup of judgments to pour out. The mother of harlots, the bride of Christ. Names of blasphemy on their foreheads, the father's name on their foreheads. The great city Babylon, the holy Jerusalem, obliterated forever and living forever. You know, the contrast of the two women is just so incredibly portrayed to us. And as Rome disappears, the bride of Christ comes into her own in chapter 19. And so we say in verse 5 of nine, chapter 19, Praise God, all his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. You know, I love that phrase in Revelation, the small and great, because we look back at some of the brethren and sisters we've seen in the past and some of the people we read about in the Bible and some of the people we read about in Brother Alan Eyre's books about who kept the faith against persecution. And we say there's a lot of great people gone before us and we're just the small. We're just doing what we can in the last days to maintain the faith. But small and great are all there. God doesn't forget anyone that actually tries to serve him. And there are a great multitude in verse 6, the voice of a great multitude of many waters. So they sound like a roaring a waterfall, thunderous sound, mighty thunderings. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And that will be the song that we will sing. And we won't just cut it short like Handel did without the reason why. We'll rejoice in the destruction of this terrible system that has benighted the earth for so long. Verse 8 again should be in the in the the past tense, to her had been granted that she was arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, 
The fine linen is the righteous actions of saints, as Brother Thomas translates it. Verse 7, she had made herself ready. So the bride at this stage is in the roles of kings and priests with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are his bride because they were ready. They did take on the garments of righteousness. They did keep them pure and white. And they've now received immortality. And, and we have this tremendous contrast between these two women. So with the whore going down, the bride of Christ is elevated to rule the world. And so he said in verse 9, right. It's interesting in Revelation how often the angel says to John, I know your eyes are glazed. I know you're sitting there thinking, wow, that's a lot of information to take in. Write this down, John. Get it down for the future generations. Write it down. Here's a summary of what this means, verse 9. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, the, the marriage of the Lamb takes place after the resurrection. We're married to Christ. We're made immortal with him. We have that, that wonderful reception to be the bride of Christ. The marriage supper takes place at the end of the conquest of the world. When Jerusalem now becomes the center of the world kingdom and the saints and Christ go there and the marriage supper takes place. The, it's like a wedding and the reception. There's a gap in between. Well, we go to this marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Go past that one. Just want to catch up where I am got to. This one. Why does he say that in verse 9? Well, you find through Revelation there are three occasions where you get this reassuring statement. And it's just popped into the record so that we never lose the fact that what we're reading is exactly what God wants us to hear. In chapter 19, verse 9, these are the true sayings of God. Chapter 21, verse 5, these words are true and faithful. Chapter 22, verse 6. These sayings are faithful and true. Never walk away from Revelation and saying, it's all too fanciful. I just can't get my head around it. This is exactly what God wants you to know. It's what God wants you to understand. It's going to happen. It's going to happen with us being there, we hope. We can be part of it. We're with him. We're part of his army. We're part of his rulership. All of those things are promised to the small and great. It's going to happen. Well, then we have in verse 10 and 11, a, a wonderful little interaction between John and the angel. Now, you know, remember John's just receiving this information and the angel saying, write it down, write it down. And John starts to write it down and he just, he just gets overwhelmed. And he drops at the feet of the angel. The angel says, John, you see, almost see the angel picking him up. John, John, don't worship me. You know, John's overwhelmed by what this angel actually knows. John. Don't do that. I am your fellow servant. And it just shows you the incredible, you know, relationship between John and the angel. The angels don't see themselves as, as above us. They're our brethren. They're working to get us into the kingdom, to have immortality like they have it. They're, 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 they're servants to the heirs of salvation. John, I'm your fellow servant. And of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Don't worship me, John. All of you see that all that I know is coming from God. Worship God. And then he says, beautiful statement that we need to take notice of. For the witness of Jesus is the spirit of the prophets. And when you see how much God loves the prophets, because they stood up and they said what God wanted said when it got them into all kinds of trouble and into death on many occasions, the spirit of witnessing about the resurrected Christ, about the return of Christ, is the same attitude of the prophets. And we're going to find it harder and harder as this world goes deeper and deeper into this stupid woke culture, in the workplace, in the universities. Every avenue of life is being affected by the crazy thinking of the world that is so far away from God. We're going to have to stand up and say, the Bible says otherwise. Not we think otherwise, the Bible says otherwise. And be prepared to take the consequences for that, as the prophets did. You know about Margaret Court, Western Australian, greatest tennis, woman tennis player that's ever been, won 16 grand slams. And because she believes in the Bible, she says the Bible does not agree with gay marriage. And they cancel her. They rub her out. They want to take a name off the stadium in Melbourne. They don't invite her 
you know, they had a, a great celebration of tennis and they didn't invite Margaret Court because she no longer is acceptable to the modern world. They want to cancel if you don't agree with them. We have to make the continuing witness to Christ in the same attitude of the prophets. It's the spirit of prophecy. And that's the witness we have to do in these last days. And so there's one of an interaction between John and the angel. I want to notice the, the, the humility of the angel. It comes up again in chapter 22. I'm your fellow servant. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. You know, the angels must have loved the prophets when there were so few people standing up for God. How they must have loved people like Daniel and Jeremiah who stood up for God. The angels are very humble. They don't put themselves above us. Very beautiful thought, isn't it? The humility of angelic nature. Well, we continue that witness. Begun by the prophets, we have to go on and carry the witness as John did in his day. And he suffered for it. You know, Domitian tried to, to get rid of John by burning him in oil, but it didn't work. So then he put him on the island of Patmos so he couldn't get, get as he thought, couldn't get his words out to many people. But, of course, the Spirit made sure otherwise would happen. So people suffered for their faith. And many of the apostles and prophets died for that faith. We have to continue the faithful witness to the things of God, brethren and sisters and young people, and not let the world dictate our thinking to us when it contradicts the Bible. Well, I want to just finish with this little last section. I'm going to do it very quickly. The last vision of chapter 19 is actually part of chapter 20, 21, but I want to get it out of the way because it's the conquest of the nation's and of the final destruction of the Catholic system worldwide. This is the third part of the great city being destroyed. So Rome's gone. The woman riding the beast is gone. But there's Catholicism right through the rest of the world, mingled in every nation. And here is the third part of the city that has to be wiped out. And it involves a campaign of horses going to war. So we have firstly the rider on the white horse. The leader of this army, and there's many horses following him. Heaven's opened, a white horse, and of course white is a symbol of purity and righteousness. He that sat upon him is called the faithful and true, and of course his words are faithful and true. This is the one that, that led the, the great stream out of mortality. Everything Christ says will come to pass with accuracy. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes are as flame of fire. And upon his head, many crowns. The many crowns indicates, of course, he will conquer many, many kingdoms. You know, this particular vision of Christ as the, the rider of the white horse is quite remarkable. Um, the many crowns. Well, let me just give you the symbols. I said I'd summarize these things. Riding a white horse, righteous battles are going to be fought. Called faithful and true, all of his words will certainly happen. The eyes of a flame of fire, you know, the fiery judgment that sees everything, that penetrates to every corner, every dark corner of the church and all the kingdoms of the world shall be rooted out. Many crowns on his head, he will conquer many kingdoms. A concealed name, there's a name given upon him which only he knows. In other words, something between him and God, because God knows everything. But there's going to be a name given to Christ a father's new name, something only he and God fully appreciate. And, of course, the saints will be brought into that secret when it happens. Something only God and Christ will comprehend because of the mental connection between the two. Garments dipped in blood, victorious because of the sacrifice he made. His name is called the word of God because he's the word made flesh. The sharp sword going from his mouth, sharp perception, clear directives, Clear and sharp decisions. And he's king of kings and lord of lords and conquers the whole world. So the rest of chapter 19 is about not only the destruction of the remnants of Catholicism, it also is the conquest of the world. And, of course, when you get to chapter 20, we're talking about the kingdom age. But notice what it says in verse 14. The armies which were in heaven or in power, in rulership, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now they followed him. We saw in chapter 17 they are with him. This is why we have to have the same view of God, of the changes that have to be made in this world and why that Catholic system must be totally obliterated. We're his armies and we go with him to battle. 
we follow him willingly into this conquest. Who are the horses? Well, when you go back through the Bible, the horse is prepared against the day of battle. The chariot horse, always indicative of warfare and conquest. Um, so the saints are, the, are those on white horses, not literally, of course, but we go out as armies of Christ to conquer the world. Righteous armies, immortal armies, justified armies. And, and we go out as a people of God to conquer the world. Quite simple symbolism when you go back through the Bible. Then it says in verse 15 that there's going to be a wine press. So the, the mouth gives sharp directions, clear directions, ruling with a rod of iron. So no dissent will be tolerated. And there'll be treading of the wine press of God's fierce wrath. Now we know the wine press is a very common symbol through the Bible. And in chapter 14, we had the same thing, a wine press and a sickle being cast and the grapes being reaped and crushed. So God's going to go right through the earth now with his judgments, getting rid of all the evil in the world. It's no surprise to me that Hollywood sits on one of the greatest fault lines uh, in the world that it just could crack off and disappear into the sea. But all the evil, think of all the, the Silicon Valley companies that are corrupting our children with the internet and Instagram and all of these things that they know are dangerous. I don't know if you know it, but Steve Jobs wouldn't let his children use the internet. He knew how dangerous it was. He wouldn't let his children use the internet. Unsupervised, but you know, had to use it at some point, but he knew he wouldn't let them just get what everyone else gets. So all those evil things the world has generated to corrupt people's minds, you know, all the, the evil systems of prostitution, gambling, drug rings, it's all got to go. It's all got to be rooted out and got rid of. That's the, the wine press will be crushed. There'll be great destruction, great loss of life. And, of course, Catholicism will be part of that worldwide. Many bunches of evil have to be crushed. A well-known Bible figure treading the wine press, you know, bringing out the blood that comes out. And then the fowls of the air come to eat it. And of course, it's not a pretty picture, is it? But again, it's the Bible way of saying that the slain of the Lord shall from one end of the earth to the other. There's going to be a tremendous loss of life. We don't rejoice in that. We rejoice in the fact that evil have to be removed. The kingdom cannot operate while men can get away with the crimes and the evil and the corruption and the pollution of people's minds that they do today. It's all got to go. And it will be the destruction of so many people who oppose the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the supper, the great supper of the Lamb is come. Well, a contrast to the marriage supper, those who oppose Christ will be eaten by birds, just like Goliath was eaten by birds. And that's the fate of the nations at Armageddon. Again, a common Bible symbol for an ignominious destruction is being left to be eaten by the beasts of the field. Those who killed the saints like criminals will suffer a similar, similar fate. Again, they'll go. Well, in verse 14, we saw in chapter 19, verse 14, that they will make war with the Lamb. Again, we just make this point. In chapter 19 and verse 19, um, it's those that were with him against his army. I just keep making that point. We have to see it how God sees it. We have to be with him. We have to follow him. We have to be willing to be part of his army when these judgments are taken upon the earth. And we'll only get to that frame of mind by clearly getting back to what God says is right and wrong and contrasting it what the world says is right and wrong because it's becoming more and more obvious that there's a big difference. And there will be an opposition to the kingdom of Christ. Just a few quotations. and I've got another whole long list of these if you wanted them with me, I think, somewhere. But Hal Lindsay was a great promoter of this idea that the Catholics invented. The Catholics came up with the idea of the Antichrist in Jerusalem. And this is what they teach. They teach that one day the world's going to have a crisis. A Jewish king will, will set up in Jerusalem and tell the world that he's going to rule the world. And we have to fight him because he's the Antichrist. Hal Lindsay. The way in which this dictator is going to step into the world will be dramatic. The person will be a Jew. He'll pose as the Messiah. Satan will give him fantastic power to work all kinds of miracles. So they won't be convinced when Russia is destroyed, when Rome is destroyed. They'll say, no, 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 it's all the power of Satan. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world dictator's rule. The Antichrist will deify himself, just like the Caesars. He will, he will build a temple in Jerusalem. It's what they believe is going to happen. 
you can see why they will fight Christ, because they say, we, we knew this was going to happen. That's why they'll have to be wiped out. Because they've got all these weird ideas that come from their own men's speculation. So it says in verse 20, the beast was taken, that is Catholic Europe, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles. Whether they elect a new pope again, probably after Rome goes, I think a new pope will rise up in Europe. But the false prophet will go. And there'll be all of those who receive the mark of the beast, all those who hang on to their Catholicism and worship his image, they'll go into the lake burning with fire and brimstone. In other words, total and utter destruction. Now, the lake of fire and brimstone is the Bible's language for utter destruction. The beast, the Catholic armies of Europe, the false prophet, the popes will never again be seen upon the earth. That system will be obliterated. And right through the earth, the nunneries, the monasteries, the cathedrals, the Catholic schools, everything will go. Every trace of Catholicism will be wiped out and destroyed. It will go into the lake of fire and brimstone. In verse 21, the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse and the sword from his mouth. And all the fowls of the earth were filled with their flesh. And it's a picture of total and utter conquest that is given to us that will happen. Given to the burning flame. And it says the beast and the false prophet shall be cast alive into the lake of fire. So again, the final destruction is going to be fast and furious and very, very deadly. They'll go into the lake of eternal destruction and oblivion. A very public judgment for the Catholic system right to the end. And that's the end of the destruction of the Catholic system, the end of the conquest of the world, and the beginning of the kingdom of Christ, which we'll deal with from here on. But it's unnecessary for us to look at that part of the Bible because it's a contrast between a whorish woman and the bride of Christ and their different fates that they will end up. We don't want to bring suffering upon anybody. But it's an honour, says the Bible, to be part of it. Psalm 149. For Yahweh takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. That the saints be joyful in glory and sing aloud upon their beds. The anticipation of this should excite us. That the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. And you can imagine as God sends us out into all the world, into little remote corners of the world, talking whatever language those people can talk, telling them what now is required of them to be part of the kingdom of God, telling them about what Christ is all about, telling them about the hope of Israel and telling them they have to submit. And when people won't submit, executing judgment, punishments upon the people, bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron to execute the judgments written. You can imagine in every country of the earth, the resistance of Catholicism right to the very end until they're wiped out. This honour have all saints, and especially those who died under the hands of the papacy. To them, it will be a very, very just retribution for that system. So what's the challenge for us, brethren and sisters? Well, we saw in chapter Revelation 19 and verse 7 and 8 that we are to be the bride of Christ. Ephesians says he loved the ecclesia and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious ecclesia, not having spot or wrinkle, any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. Whenever a girl gets engaged after the flashing of the ring, it's always what's the date for the wedding? It's always the question, isn't it? Most brides work it out before they even get engaged. When's the wedding going to be? Well, this bride doesn't know. We don't have a date. All we have are signs. So there has to be careful preparation for a wedding. I'm always amazed the, the detail that, that girls and their mothers go into when a wedding is pending and how much preparation goes into it and how much thought goes into it. But we don't know the day. We don't know the hour of our calling. those who have the extra oil, those who've got their minds in the word of God, those who've kept their imputed garments, those who wash them in the blood of the lamb through forgiveness, 
who are ready when the Lord comes will go in to be his army, his people, his followers. So let's summarise what we've seen in Revelation 18 and 19. We should share God's hatred for this evil Catholic system and particularly what it's inflicted upon our brethren. Now, there's some tremendous talks on Christadelphian websites by Brother Mike Jenner about what's happened to our brethren down through the centuries. We need to have an appreciation of that history so that we're in sympathy with God. As Christ will be long-suffering, giving perhaps 30 years in total for Jerusalem for Catholics who submit, we need to be long-suffering to those who are deceived. But this honour have all the saints. We look forward to being amongst those saints to purge the world of evil and then to work on the great work of the thousand years to bring in everlasting righteousness and peace. Brethren and sisters, let's make sure as a bride that we are ready when our Lord returns.